Hello, my name is Teresa Hargreaves. I'm a member of the personal injury and clinical negligence groups here at number five chambers. Um, whilst the COVID-19 pandemic may have caused the court system to stutter and stall, the same cannot be said of the needs for CPD training. So we're embracing the new normal and presenting training by way of um, short and easily accessible webinars. Today, um, I, together with Gareth Compton, a fellow member of the Personal Injury Group, are going to be talking to you about the thorny issue of recording of medico-legal examinations. This issue has been the subject of two significant decisions within the last nine months. Uh, I'll be talking to you about the first decision, which is the case of mustard against flour. And the citation will come up on the, it should be on the screen. Um, it was a case decided by Master Davison back in October of 2019. Um, brief facts of the case. The claimant had been involved in a rear-end um, shunt type road traffic accident, liability for which was not in dispute. The claimant claimed that she had sustained a subarachnoid brain hemorrhage and a diffuse axonal brain injury, which left her with cognitive and other deficits. The defendant's arguments were that the impact had been relatively minor, and the defendant's expert said that the claimant had suffered either no or only minor brain injury. Directions were given by the court, which gave permission for the parties to rely upon expert evidence in the fields of orthopaedics, neurology, neuropsychology, neuropsychiatry, audiology, radiology, neuroradiology, neurosurgery and engineering. Prior to being examined by the defendant's experts, the claimant had been advised by her solicitor to record the examinations on a digital device. Notice was given to the defendant's solicitors that she was going to do that. In respect of the orthopaedic and neurosurgical experts, she did record the examinations, but covertly. In respect of the neuropsychologist, Dr Torrens, she asked for the expert's permission before recording. Permission was given, but only in respect of the clinical examination part. Permission was specifically refused by the expert for the neuropsychological testing part of the examination. It was accepted by the court that the claimant had tried, but inadvertently failed to turn off the device prior to the testing being undertaken. And so, in fact, the whole consultation was recorded. The defendants invited the claimant to record the examinations with her own experts. No undertaking was given to that effect by the claimant, and in the end, she did not. The matter came before Master Davison by way of an application by the defendant to exclude the covert recordings and a cross-application by the claimant to rely upon a supplementary report from the claimant's neuropsychologist, Dr Morris, which stated that the recording demonstrated that Dr Torrens had made serious errors in her administration of the neuropsychological testing, such as to render it of doubtful value. The specific arguments raised by the defendants in relation to recording of the neuropsychological testing parts of the examination were firstly that the tests were protected by copyright of the companies which devise and sell the tests, and so there are commercial implications of them being recorded. Secondly, that recording risked the claimant being unaccessible on any future occasion due to the recording providing some sort of method of coaching or preparation for any such future tests, uh, and therefore making a comparison between tests um, difficult or invalid. And thirdly, that the recording would provide insider knowledge to claimant solicitors generally about the content and methodology of tests, such that future claimants could be coached or prepared for the tests. The defendants relied upon the guidance given from the British Psychological Society to that effect. The court, uh, Master Davison, decided that the tests that had to be applied to this application and cross-application, the court had to consider that the means employed to obtain the evidence, together with its relevance and probative value, and the effect that admitting or not admitting it would have on the fairness of the litigation process and the trial. In other words, the issue was whether the public policy issue, interest in excluding evidence improperly obtained was trumped by the important but narrower objective of achieving justice in particular cases. The Master's decision, perhaps unsurprisingly, was to admit the evidence in this particular case. 
His decision was that the recordings were not in breach of either the Data Protection Act or GDPR. The covert recordings were not unlawful. The recordings were highly relevant and probative. Firstly, legitimate questions had been raised as to Dr Torren's competence and issues had also been raised from the recordings of the orthopaedic and neurosurgical examinations in respect of the claimant's factual account to them and that those were issues for trial. The defendant's argument that the absence of recording of the claimant's experts removed a level playing field between the parties was only in this particular case theoretical because the defendants couldn't point to any aspect of the claimant's expert evidence uh, which a recording would assist to resolve. The issue came to be considered again in the case of Macdonald and Burton, which Gareth will now discuss. So emboldened by their success in Mustard, the same solicitors representing the claimant in another case decided to make a prospective application for permission for their client to film his consultation with a defendant neuropsychologist. Um, this came before Mr Justice Spencer and the cases Macdonald and Burton and it was heard in March this year, so six months or so after their success in Mustard. And the argument that they ran was very much based upon the decision of the master in the Mustard case. Um, they also cited an earlier case from 2008 in which the same solicitors for the claimant, and indeed the same counsel, had um, successfully destroyed is the only word for it, the evidence of a neuropsychologist in the case of Williams and Jervis. In that case, the 2008 case, the claimant had covertly recorded uh, the consultation with the neuropsychologist and there were very significant discrepancies in the history as recorded by the neuropsychologist, which the neuropsychologist used damningly to damage the claimant's case, compared with what the claimant actually said and what the claimant demonstrated had been said by the recording. And in the Macdonald case, therefore, reliant upon Mustard and the earlier case of Williams and Jervis, they said it is necessary for a claimant to record their examinations with the defendant's experts because, as these cases demonstrate, defendant's experts can be incompetent or worse. The defendants very strongly resisted this and it being a prospective application, of course, unlike Mustard, there was no evidence that the defendant's expert had done anything wrong or would do anything wrong. And the resistance was on the same or very similar grounds that the resistance in Mustard was based. Uh, the defendant's expert had a witness statement in which he very strongly argued that there would be no level playing field because the claimants had already been examined by their own neuropsychologist and that examination had not been recording. So the circumstances would be different. One not recorded, one recorded. And the defendant's expert very strongly argued that the mere fact of recording a examination, overtly recording in this case, would change the conditions of the examination. As he put it, it would change the dynamic of the examination. The claimant's behavior would be different it was also argued that it would make the claimant untestable were the claimant in the future to require another examination by a neuropsychologist because the claimant would be able to replay the previous examination and essentially would know what the questions were going to be and could tailor their responses. It was argued, as it had been argued in Mustard, that the neuropsychological testing tests were copyrighted and there were therefore there was some property in them and that it would be a breach of the copyright of the tests which the neuropsychologists purchase if they were to be broadcast. There were also broader concerns raised that a claimant team would now broadly know 
what questions were asked in neuropsychological tests and could coach future claimants. And they relied upon evidence from the American Society of Neuropsychologists who had successfully and strongly argued that recording of neuropsychological testing in the States ought not to be allowed um, for that very reason. And the defendant's expert in the McDonald case was able to call upon various articles um, published since the Williams and Jervis case, and in particular, strong support from the British Psychological Society, who deprecated the recording of neuropsychological tests. Now, the judge um, considered these arguments and noted the danger of the risk, rather, to claimants of defendants either negligently or deliberately misrepresenting what a claimant might say in an examination, or indeed, as in the Mustard case, the way in which the psychological tests were um, put to the claimant. But the judge, Mr Justice Spencer, nevertheless concluded that recording would not be allowed in this case. And he, in reaching that conclusion, very strongly relied upon the weight of expert evidence against him, against the claimant. The claimant could cite support from their side's neuropsychologist, but their own psychologist had to acknowledge that there were risks attached to the recording of examinations, although the claimant's expert understandably sought to minimise those risks, said that they could be mitigated in various ways. But it is clear that overwhelming expert opinion in the McDonald case was against the recording of the examination. The judge also went on to consider the trickier issue of privilege. And it's worth, I think, me noting precisely what he said in respect of that. He said, there is a second issue which has been referred to me, which relates to the question of any privilege which may exist in any recordings that are made. After some confusion, the issue resolved itself to whether where a claimant records an examination and or testing by his own experts, the disclosure of the expert's report entails a waiver of any privilege that might exist in the recording. Mr Grant, who was counsel for the claimant, had previously understood that the issue was whether there would be any such privilege in the recording of an examination or testing by the other side's expert, i.e. the defendant's expert. And the judge said this, I would have no difficulty in answering that question that there could be no such privilege on the basis that the recording could equally have been carried out by the defendant's expert or on behalf of the defendant. The recording would, of course, have been exactly the same and there would have been no question of any privilege attaching. So in one sentence, and in terms which suggest that the answer is obvious, uh, the judge expressed the view that there can be no privilege attaching to the recording by a claimant of his or her examination with the defendant, defendant's expert. The judge went on to consider what he thought was the trickier question of whether privilege could attach to a claimant's recording of an examination by their own expert, and he concluded that no such privilege could attach, that the moment the claimant decided to disclose that particular expert's report, any privilege which attached to the recording would fall away and the recording would have to be disclosed. The judge did say that if a claimant was examined by his or her own expert and had his solicitor or a legal representative present, and that legal representative made notes, those notes would not uh, be disclosable. Legal privilege would attach to them. And I think that that discussion of the privilege issue in almost obiter comments is perhaps one of the most interesting aspects of the McDonald case. And it's one which now I will discuss with Theresa. So Theresa, what struck me about these um, two cases that we've been talking about is two decisions on exactly the same subject, survey, um, recording of medical examinations, six months apart, diametrically opposite decisions reached, 
but that when reading the judgments, it's totally obvious from the moment you start reading the facts of the case why, where the judge is going to end up. So in Mustard, was there any way that that judge was going to keep the covert recording of that neuropsych out no. when the neuropsych had so obviously um, behaved badly yeah. or negligently? And equally, <clears throat> in the McDonald case, was Mr Justice Spencer ever going to allow the uh, overt recording of that examination when he's got the British Psychological Society and God knows how many neuropsychs telling him he shouldn't. I know, exactly. It's, um, it, they are very obvious decisions. It, it's, going, it's going to be interesting to see whether, first of all, whether the working party that was set up after, on the invitation of Master Davison uh, in Mustard, whether that's actually going to result in what uh, Mr Justice Spencer hoped and kind of... Um, dodged the bullet in sort of handing it over to them to come up with some sort of protocol, whether that's actually going to be the case or not, it's going to be interesting to see. Yeah, um, and Spencer, it seemed to me, in um, the McDonald decision, really just dodged the, what the, defend, what the claimant said was the elephant in the room, which is, well, if you're not going to allow recordings of examinations, how are we going to find out about the malign or the negligent experts? Because yeah. they are out there. Yeah. And it seems particularly in neuropsychology, the way in which the tests are put, it's open to potential abuse by um, defendant experts. And he yeah. says that obviously, he says it's obvious that this needs to be dealt with, whilst at the same time making a decision which prevents the recording of neuropsych exams. Yeah, I think it's um, a, a, the bit of his judgment where he decided that... Um, the defendant's expert shouldn't be recorded and he goes on to specifically say that if it transpires that the claimant has covert has, goes on to covertly record the examination then that would have serious implications for his claim um, but that ignores the fact that if that covert recording then went on to disclose incompetence or malevolence on the part of the expert the decision is obviously going to follow mustard and th that recording would be allowed in and so it, it, it's it's an unsatisfactory resolution to the issue, I think. Yeah. And how is it going to be resolved? Because at the moment we've got, we're awaiting a report from the British Psychological Society, which is pretty obviously given the way the psychological, the neuropsych evidence came out in McDonald's, is going to be against recording of examinations. You can understand why. The experts hate it. It calls into question their integrity, their professionalism, their independence. And 99.9% .9 of them, I'm sure there is, would be no question about them doing anything wrong. Um, but at the same time, we're going to have this second report from APIL and the Federation of Insurance Lawyers. What are they going to say? And I, I can only imagine that they'll, they will say overt recordings are permissible, in which case every examination is going to be recorded, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't understand how the how they're going to reach a protocol which will balance those two conflicting um, positions. It's, it's going to be interesting to see. But it is. Uh, it is, and we're going to get a lot more recordings of examinations. Yes. Yeah. A lot more recording. It may even become the norm. Yes. The other point that I thought was really interesting was how Spencer J dealt with privilege. Yes. Because I totally get the point that if the claimant records his or her own expert's examination, when the claimant decides, decides to disclose that report, that recording then becomes disclosable. What I do not get totally is how there can be no question of privilege attaching when a claimant covertly records a defendant's examination, how somehow that automatically becomes disclosable when the defendant chooses to disclose the report. Yeah, there's a there's an uncomfortable there's no explanation by um, Mr. Justice Spencer and as to why it was such an obvious decision for him to make and um, and I think you raised the question as to how does that fit with um, defendants surveillance evidence of of claimants um, covert surveillance of of claimants that attaches um, privilege attaches to that where it wouldn't to this so it, it it's an it's an uncomfortable situation to reconcile I think. Yeah. And that's the bigger picture isn't it because recording covert or overtly a medical examination is pretty unusual I've mm. never come across it. It's obvious mm. the three cases that we've talked about today it's the same claimant firm of solicitors it's the same claimant barrister yep. in fact who are clearly recommending this as a norm I've yep. never come across it I would never have dreamt of 
advising a client to do it. No. Um, but what's much more common, obviously, is defendants covertly surveilling um, claimants. Yeah. And the law is really well understood that that is a privileged document and the defendant can choose to disclose it or not to disclose it. And to yeah. a significant extent, they can even choose when to disclose it. If Mr Justice Spencer's reasoning is followed in respect of covert recording of a defendant's examination, I wonder whether, if applied to covert surveillance of a claimant, when the claimant's witness statement is disclosed and his case on what he can do and what he can't do then becomes clear, does that, would it not follow that the defendant would then have to disclose their surveillance evidence? Yeah. I don't know. I'm sure we're not going to get to that position, but it seems to be analogous to me. Yeah. And I, I, I suppose the, the, the this crucial difference between the two is that if the claimant has covertly recorded the examination by the defendant's expert, the defendant then chooses to disclose that report. If there isn't a conflict between reality and the report, then there wouldn't need to be an analysis of any recording. If there is a difference, then the claimant would choose to, re to, to disclose it anyway. So it might not have the same um, implications as it does in respect of covert surveillance of the claimant, but, but it's, it's still difficult to see, to resolve the two arguments as to why privilege doesn't attach to one, but it does to the other. Yeah. Final point I thought was interesting was that in Mustard, the defendant went big on Data Protection Act. Mm and um, GDPR, and it wasn't even raised in McDonald's no. argument. It seems completely to have been put to bed that it's yeah. accepted that there are no data protection issues. And I think, was, was it accepted by the British Psychological Society that actually it complies with um, data protection? Yes. Actually, and the GMC, I've read an article where the GMC accept the same thing, that yeah. whilst they don't like people recording them, particularly covertly, it's not a breach of the data protection rules to do it.